Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm Dr. Matthew Levitt. I have the pleasure of directing the Institute's Reinhard Program on Counterterrorism uh, and Intelligence. And I'm very, very pleased to be joined here today by the acting director of the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, Russell Travers. Uh, today's uh, conversation is part of the Institute's ongoing uh, counterterrorism lecture series. Um, Russell took office at NCTC as acting director uh, in August, uh, but uh, it's not his first, second, or third time in the building. Uh, he's held many other leadership positions within NCTC, including deputy director, counselor to the director, acting director of the Office of Data Strategy and Innovation, chief data officer, among others. Uh, he's held positions at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Council, the NIC, uh, the U.S. Army, Joint Chiefs of Staff. So we're really very thrilled uh, that he's um, been able to carve time out of his busy schedule uh, and spend some time with us today to talk about counterterrorism in an era of competing priorities. Uh, Russell will deliver some opening remarks here from the podium, and then we'll sit down for a little uh, fireside chat. I'll take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first few questions, and then I will open it up to all of you who are here in attendance in person to ask some questions, and we uh, Welcome uh, all of you who are watching via live stream or via C-SPAN. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Russell, the podium is yours. So thanks very much, Matt. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here amongst uh, a number of old friends uh, to talk about counterterrorism in an era of competing resources. Uh, I happened to testify earlier this week with the leadership of the FBI and DHS, and I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday from DHS, and she said that a colleague of hers had, had seen the testimony, and that uh, he characterized my performance as that of a thoughtful nerd. So I am hoping to aspire to something more than nerddom here this afternoon. Um, kidding aside, uh, the issue of competing priorities is extraordinarily important. Uh, we are now almost two decades past 9-11, and if we continue to succeed in protecting against large-scale attacks against the homeland, I think this notion of competing uh, priorities is going to do nothing but get more challenging, as it should. Uh, ever since former Secretary Mattis issued the National Defense Strategy last year, there's been an ongoing, at least implicit, discussion about risk. How does the threat of terrorism stack up relative to threats posed by great powers, or North Korea, or Iran, or Syria, or lots of other threats? The testimony earlier this week was with FBI and DHS leadership, as I mentioned, and along with terrorism, they laid out a dizzying array of different kinds of threats. Election security, counterintelligence, intellectual property theft, transnational organized crime, which frankly kills far more Americans than terrorism ever will. And as I said at the hearing, it is completely understandable that terrorism may no longer be viewed as the number one threat to the country, but I don't know what that means. And I think it begs a host of questions. I offered three. What does the national risk equation look like as the country confronts a very complex international security environment? Secondly, how do we optimize CT resources in the best interest of the country when departments and agencies may have somewhat differing priorities? And if we're going to reduce efforts against terrorism, how do we do so in a manner that doesn't inadvertently reverse some of the gains of the past 18 years? So what I'd like to do for the next 35 minutes or so is walk you through a bit of a roadmap for the issues that I think need to be considered as we address those questions. I'm going to develop 10 themes. In doing so, I'm going to start you at the geostrategic and work your way down to the electron level and then back up again. So theme number one, good news. Let me say at the outset, terrorism is not, never has been, an existential threat to the country unless it changes who we are. It does, however, hold out the potential for killing a very large number of people. And as history has shown, it can occupy the country's attention for a very long time and prevent other important things from getting done. Fortunately, we've made a lot of progress on the terrorism front. The last significant al-Qaeda-directed attack in the West was Charlie Hebdo, five years ago. The last centrally directed ISIS attack in the West was the Turkish nightclub three years ago. And before that, Paris and Brussels. Homeland violent extremist attacks are down. The U.S. has had one this past year, and roughly a half dozen in Europe. 
both numbers substantially lower than previous years. While capabilities ebb and flow, we've seen ISIS struggle to sustain success, for instance, in Libya, where the franchise is not doing very well. None of the success is by accident. There has been tremendous military and intelligence efforts in Iraq and Syria to eliminate the so-called caliphate. Many skilled operatives have been captured and killed, and that has had many second-order effects. There's less sophisticated messaging, there's squabbling, there are morale issues. And it's not just Iraq and Syria. We have removed leadership from around the globe. DHS, FBI, and state have pushed borders out and made the homeland much less hospitable to terrorists. We've also seen global efforts to improve border security, particularly in the EU after Paris and Brussels. We've seen a growing partnership with the private sector to make cyberspace less hospitable. And services around the globe are working together against terrorism, unlike the efforts against any other national security discipline. U.S. continues to pass on lessons learned to inter interested foreign parties with a robust exercise program that addresses information sharing and interagency cooperation. And we are seeing capacity building in other countries. Improvements in inter-service cooperation, enhancements in information sharing that can mitigate the impact of terrorist attacks. You compare the Kenyan response to the Shabab attacks against the Westgate Mall in 2013 and the Doucet Hotel earlier this year. It was dealt with far faster, with far fewer casualties. So we will never eliminate terrorism, but a tremendous amount of good work has been done, and that actually allows for this conversation about comparative risk. And that brings me to theme two, which is a concern for the potential for complacency. We do need to be careful. When I started working counterterrorism after 9-11, we were overwhelmingly focused on Al-Qaeda and a centrally directed threat emanating from one piece of real estate along the AFPAC border. Eighteen years later, we see a diverse, diffuse threat that spans the globe. The primary Islamist threat in many of our countries has been homegrown violent extremism. Despite the elimination of the so-called caliphate, we have an active ISIS insurgency in Iraq and Syria and a sufficient command structure such that it maintains cohesion over 20-odd ISIS branches and networks. Some are very small, others have got thousands of people. Nine of them have pledged allegiance to the new ISIS leader over the past week. We have Al-Qaeda that has received rather less attention over the past few years, but it too retains a command structure and a half dozen affiliates. And we see growing connections and coordination between and among its affiliates. There are also a full range of Shia-related threats, certainly Hezbollah and the Iranian Quds Force, <clears throat> also a growing concern for the Shia militant groups in Iraq. And if the various strands of Islamist extremism weren't complicated enough, we are also seeing a growing global threat of particularly extreme right-wing related terrorism. More on that later. <clears throat> Terrorists around the globe are proving very capable at exploiting technology. They're good at it, but they're innovative the use of encrypted communications for operational planning, social media to spread propaganda and transfer knowledge between and amongst individuals and networks, drones for swarm attacks, explosive delivery means, and even assassination attempts, high quality fraudulent travel documents that undermine a namespace screening and watch listing system and threaten border security, cryptocurrencies to fund operations, and the potential terrorist use of chemical and biological weapons has moved from a low probability eventuality to something that is considered much more likely. <clears throat> In many cases, terrorist exploitation of technology has outpaced the associated legal and policy framework to deal with the threat. Looking out five years, we are particularly concerned with the growing adverse impact encryption will have on our counterterrorism efforts. And this is a key point. We can't freeze our thinking in 2019. We always need to be looking to the future. Finally, both Al-Qaeda and ISIS have shown themselves to be successful at radicalizing vulnerable populations around the globe. Sometimes they deploy emissaries to establish and organize a group. Sometimes an emissary is deployed to support an existing group. Sometimes an emissary is already present with historic ties or personal connections. Sometimes it's done remotely via social media or letters and sometimes a group deployed to an emissary to an ISIS core. <clears throat> they are innovative in bolstering their ranks. And that brings me to theme three, 
which is the need for focus on prevention. By any objective standard, there are far more radicalized people now than there were at 9-11. Some think tanks have suggested that we're looking at four times the number of radicalized individuals, and our own database of known and suspected terrorists has grown by a factor of almost 20. So unless you believe this fervor will simply burn itself out, we will be faced with a growing radicalization problem around the globe. No single factor captures the complexity of the radicalization process among disaffected Sunni youth worldwide. We believe a mix of personal, group, community, sociopolitical, and ideological factors contribute to the radicalization of Sunni youth, their recruitment to extremist Sunni organizations, and their mobilization to violence. We are gradually, as a world, accumulating more empirical data. For instance, the United Nations Development Program Regional Bureau for Africa evaluated 718 active or former African extremists, mostly from al-Shabaab or Boko Haram, to identify the reasons individuals were radicalized and recruited into extremist organizations at the person level. The most important factor cited was human rights violations by the government security forces but also poverty, the nature of religious education, stable families, and government corruption. But it's just not about poverty and being downtrodden. As we saw in Sri Lanka, the individuals were well-educated and relatively well-off, but radicalized by hate preachers. There is a great deal of fertile ground in countries, and we are facing growing radicalization in prisons, and even amongst young children who are being targeted by extremist propaganda. There are various initiatives associated with messaging, de-radicalization, defection programs, reintegration, off-ramping, as well as broader programs focused on good governance, economic development, and human rights. Available resources remains a significant global problem. If the numbers of radicalized people around the globe keeps growing, I just do not like our odds of identifying the right people to capture, kill, keep out of the country and there are second and third order effects. As the situation gets worse in Africa and climate change takes its toll, we are seeing greater forced migration. And the movement of migrants to Europe in turn is exacerbating tensions, giving further rise to right-wing violence to protest this migration. It is a vicious cycle. Brings me to theme four, the need to focus on identities, people of concern. Terrorist threats revolve around people and networks. And while tracking identities is pretty arcane stuff, not as interesting as talking about the future of ISIS or the latest strike, it is incredibly important. Our terrorist identities work underpins much of the US government's screening and vetting architecture that evaluates 3.2 million people a day. And this is where we failed the country on 9-11. Two of the hijackers were allowed to get visas, live in the country, and eventually get on airplanes because we were insufficiently stitched together. An enormous amount of effort has been expended over the past 18 years. We have effectively pushed borders out, creating a multi-layered defense to identify individuals with terrorist connections at the earliest possible point. And we have continually improved, building richer dossiers, making better use of technology, performing near real time classified screening to support unclassified watch lists, and where possible, making use of biometrics. This will never be a risk-free proposition, but the system has overall performed extraordinarily well. NCTC, working with our partners, is responsible for compiling the U.S. government database of KSTs, known and suspected, known or suspected terrorists, and the data is used to support screening partners. There has been some confusion on this point, and when we talk about KSTs, precision is very important. Each day, approximately three individuals that meet the definition of a KST seek entry or permission to come to the country. This is not to say that they intend to conduct an attack, simply that there is sufficient derogatory information that warrants scrutiny. Upwards of another seven watchlisted individuals per day may have connections to KSTs, but we lack individual derogatory information required to them to consider them known or suspected terrorists. As you might imagine, when three million people per day are screened, drawing conclusions about any one particular individual can be fraught with challenges. But over the course of 16 years, the system has stood the test of time. 
In some cases, refugees, for instance, extra levels of scrutiny are provided. We have no indication that foreign terrorist groups have attempted to exploit the refugee admissions program, and robust screening and vetting probably limit their ability to do so. Over the past two decade, the past decade, there have only been two individuals who arrived as refugees and went on to conduct attacks in the homeland, both radicalized after traveling to the United States. Our track record is pretty good. However, as effective as we are, we can't let rest on our laurels. There are some warning signs. As we saw in the case of the Paris and Brussels attacks, many of the individuals were known to security services but they had high quality fake passports and national ID cards. Biographically based lists are on the wrong side of history. We saw this in northern Syria where captured foreign fighters routinely gave fake names. Hence, FBI and the Defense Department focused on biometrically enrolling as many people as they could. We've also got ever increasing amounts of information. How do we process the volume of information and ensure high quality databases? I'll get into that in a few minutes. In my opinion, we should be treating this period much like we did that after 9-11. What are we trying to accomplish, and how are we going to get there? We have a lot of piece parts, and we need to ensure they are properly stitched together. The five, ten-year vision should be a near real-time biographic and biometric screening against all available U.S. government information to determine if an individual is a known or suspected terrorist. This would involve greater focus on collection, integration and sharing of biometrics as well as business process and information technology improvements. The benefits would extend well beyond counterterrorism and support screening against other categories of threats. And that brings me to theme five, the need for robust intelligence. None of this happens unless we maintain a robust integrated intelligence capability. There is no question that the counterterrorism enterprise is the best integrated part of the intelligence community. We've been doing it as a community for a very long time. But as good as we are, and as well resourced, there will be significant challenges going forward. A globally dispersed and diffuse terrorism threat that involves individuals and networks places great pressure on our intelligence services. We need to evaluate the terrorist threat at multiple levels and have sufficient insight to determine if and when they pose a growing threat. The first level is typified by the Sri Lanka problem. This was simply not a high priority before us before last Easter. The most hardline Islamist group, SLTJ, had denounced ISIS in 2016. And that spawned a much smaller entity, NTJ, that was apparently responsible. It had been a bit of a fringe element, primarily known for attacks on Buddhist statues. Not obviously associated with ISIS, we didn't recognize the threat. One step up from that would be local indigenous Islamic insurgencies around the globe who seek to affiliate themselves with ISIS. And with that comes greater interest in attacking Western interests. Consider the long-standing insurgency in northern Mozambique where recently they have affiliated with ISIS and are now focused on attacks on U.S. energy interests. Extrapolate that to the 20-odd current and budding ISIS affiliates around the world, you get some sense of the intelligence challenge. And then one level higher. We need to have sufficient insight into these indigenous insurgencies to assess if and when they may be expanding beyond a country local uh, threat to one that may threaten the homeland. This has been a challenge in the past. In 2009, we thought of AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, as a regional threat. On Christmas Day of 2009, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib attempted to blow up Northwest Flight 253 over Detroit. And in 2010, we, reviewed, we viewed the Pakistani Taliban as a regionally based South Asia threat. And yet they trained Faisal Shahzad, who went on to attempt a bombing in New York City Times Square. Think about the broad array of people and networks and their ability to exploit technology, and we have more than a few challenges. At the macro level, as we adjust to priorities to other threats, there is no question that intelligence resources, collection, and analytic will be shifted away from terrorism to other priorities. Actions have consequences. What do we stop focusing on? What is the associated risk? And as we draw down military forces, we will have less human 
and intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets capable in theater. There will be less liaison with on-the-ground partners. Those are simply facts. With those facts come a degree of risk, and we'll need to determine how great that risk is, whether it can be compensated for, and so forth. And then at the national level, we need to ensure that we have the right constellation of organizations and authorities. This is a very large enterprise. There is duplication. There will need to be rationalization going forward to ensure that we are using resources wisely. And that brings me to theme seven, the need to get the electrons right. If we're going to get the intelligence right, we need to get the electrons right. Data is everything. Whether we're looking for strategic trends or conducting tactical level analysis associated with individuals and networks, data is the lifeblood of the counterterrorism community. The data challenges we face are extraordinarily complex, particularly when we're dealing with information that is invariably incomplete, generally ambiguous, and often wrong. Ten years ago this month, a Nigerian father walked into the embassy in Abuja and said his son may be associated with extremists in Yemen. That cable was available to every counterterrorism analyst in the government. It got no attention. A month later, he tried to blow up Northwest Flight 253 over Detroit. Other data existed, but the relationships weren't obvious, and we did not connect the dots. I have spent my entire career working analytic issues and will say unequivocally that counterterrorism has the worst signal-to-noise ratio of any discipline with which I've ever been associated. If I put you in the shoes of an NCTC analyst who has been working in counterterrorism since 9-11, he or she has seen a quarter of a million threats. Overwhelmingly, they were bogus. But when they come in, how exactly do you know? To get a little more concrete, we average about 300 threats to our embassies and consulates abroad every year, almost one a day. To get even a little more concrete, my Ops Center receives something in excess of 10,000 terrorism-related intelligence reports a day through which they need to sift. And those 10,000 reports contain 16,000 names, daily. All our services are challenged by the need to process ever-expanding amounts of data in order to cover, uncover potential terrorist threats. With the growth of captured media on the battlefield or the explosion of social media, the magnitude of that problem only goes. Terrorists have to communicate, they have to move money, they have to travel. But strictly speaking, these data sets aren't terrorism information. So they can quickly implicate legal, policy, privacy, and operational equities that limit the sharing and processing of such data. Determining which information is relevant and addressing the competing equities associated with processing that data remains a work in progress. I will never have enough analysts to process the available information, so artificial intelligence and machine learning are not nice to have. They are absolute imperatives. As such, I noted with interest earlier this week, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, chaired by Eric Schmidt, former executive chairman of Google, issued its interim report. Here's a quote. Quote, with respect to data, the government is well positioned to collect useful information from its worldwide network of sensors. But much of that data is unlabeled, hidden in various silos across disparate networks, or inaccessible to the government. Even more data is simply expelled as, quote, exhaust because it is not deemed to be immediately relevant. And the infrastructure is woefully inadequate to process this information. We have a very long ways to go to realize the benefits of AI and ML. And in the case of terrorism, the problem is particularly difficult because so much of our data is unstructured. And it's all unstructured in different ways. That makes it very difficult for machines to help our analysts. Now, harken back to what I said about the evolving nature of the threat. It's all about individuals and networks. And as we have seen with homegrown violent extremists, it can be extraordinarily difficult to uncover these individuals. The haystack has continued to grow, and the needles are increasingly subtle. We are seeing this problem across the Western world, where partners may be dealing with thousands or tens of thousands of radicalized individuals and subjects of interest. That brings me to theme seven. It's kind of a rhetorical question. I'm going to take you on a bit of a side road here. What does America want us to do in the realm of discovery and uncovering individuals? Terrorism, like all transnational threats, poses unique challenges because it blurs concepts like foreign and domestic. 
As such, our efforts to ensure public safety can quickly bump up against issues of privacy. Part of the government's response after 9-11 was to provide NCTC with very broad authorities to receive terrorism information. In my opinion, that was an extremely good move. And with that came extensive oversight and compliance regime, and I'm actually extraordinarily proud of the center's record in this regard. And indeed, my experience has been that the entire community is very conscientious about these issues. But looking forward, and given the pace of technological change, it seems to me the issues are going to become more difficult and the need for an informed, transparent public discussion becomes greater. How do we square the circle? Keeping the country safe in a world of transnational threats that straddle the foreign and domestic divide, yet adequately balancing the protection of legitimate privacy rights. There is no consensus in the country about that balance. The notion of discovery, quote unquote, is a case in point. That linking non-obvious relationships and finding unknown unknowns, some might call this dot connecting. How much can we, should we do? The processing of inexplicable amounts of information is enormously complex and defies any simple solution. International cyber criminals, terrorists, proliferation, proliferators, and transnational criminals have linkages into the United States. They may be U.S. persons with foreign connections, or they may travel here, call here, or use our financial institutions. They use our openness against us. Exploiting the attributions of globalization, they can easily hide in the daily noise associated with millions of people that cross our borders, or the trillions of dollars that slosh around globally, or the unimaginable amounts of telecommunication activity. In virtually all cases, the data associated with these nefarious actors is sitting side by side in data repositories that also hold information on completely innocent U.S. persons. There are lots of complicated challenges that limit our ability to do discovery. In the case of the 1225 underwear bomber, it was a function of dots being lost in the background noise and an inability to discern non-obvious relationships between two apparently innocuous pieces of information. In other cases, relevant data may exist in various department and agency repositories. But for operational, law enforcement, or privacy reasons, the information is not broadly available. Retention and subsequent use issues are major limitations when it comes to commingling such information. And in still other cases, for instance, in the case of financial data, the relevant information resides in entirely separate repositories that preclude any large-scale cross stovepipe analysis. Defaulting to slogans like the need to balance privacy and security may sound superficially attractive, but it isn't really helpful. Which electrons should be accessible to which organizations for what purpose and when? Let me give you some representative questions. First, what level and type of counterterrorism risk should we be willing to tolerate in order to preserve critical freedoms and liberties? And perhaps most importantly, how can the national security community structure a dialogue with the American public to constructively address the question? Second, how, as a national security community, do we govern and approach the exploitation of the Internet, particularly at a time when, A, technology is far outpacing legal and policy rulemaking, and B, we're able to find information on the Internet that is far more rich, valuable, and intrusive than other types of collections subject to strict constitutional and statutory regulation? And third, what is the role of the private sector in national security counterterrorism activities? Is there a point at which private sector and government are collaborating so closely, particularly in the area of data collection, that there is an intolerable privacy risk to individuals? I suspect these kinds of questions and the associated trade-offs are going to be increasingly important as we look to the future. All right, let me move away from electrons back to th the last three themes, broader national security issues. Theme eight, the need for whole of government. Counterterrorism intelligence integration across all relevant departments and agencies, particularly in an era of constrained resources, will be critical and, I suspect, increasingly difficult. It will also be insufficient. 
As we found over the past two decades, we need whole of government integration. That's an, always been a challenge for us. As any practitioner will acknowledge, the reality of the way the government is configured limits interagency effectiveness. We are a government of departmental sovereignty. It's the way we're designed, the way money's appropriated, the way congressional oversight works. We have hardwired silos of excellence across the government. Certainly that's not a new issue. Endless studies have been written about the interagency process. I think the 9-11 Commission had it about right, quote, it is hard to break down stovepipes where there are so many stoves that are legally and politically entitled to have cast iron pipes of their own, unquote. Not impossible. One very good example was the post 9-11 watch listing and screening architecture that brought together the entirety of the government. But even that has been under stress as departments and agencies begin to adjust to evolving priorities. NCTC's Directorate for Strategic Operational Planning has a role in convening the interagency to develop whole of government CT strategies. Arguably, the enterprise is more coordinated than any other mission, in part because of those efforts. That said, information efforts, integration efforts such as these will always struggle in a system of departmental sovereignty and in the absence of sufficient authority to compel cooperation. Now, in theory, integration happens at the National Security Council, and that largely happened in the years after 9-11. Counterterrorism was a major focus at the most senior levels of the government because of the imminence of the threat. During a high threat environment when we were routinely seeing major Al-Qaeda plots, there were, in fact, multiple deputies and principals committee meetings every week. There was tremendous interagency attention was voted at all levels. Understandably, as the perceived threat has declined, so has the degree of interagency focus. In addition, there's been a degree of downsizing and de-emphasizing NSC integration, a trend that goes back to the last administration. There's been a sense that decisions could be kicked back to departments and agencies, <coughs> excuse me, partly because of a perception of micromanagement and partly born of a desire to wean departments and agencies off relying on the NSC. We need to watch this very carefully to determine how well it does or doesn't work. There's no question, the NSC will continue to handle the very highest priority issues. But what happens when lesser important questions aren't recognized as important until they are? Remember, it was the very arcane subject of watch listing and screening that failed the country leading up to 9-11. And it was the technical issue of classified network access that gave rise to WikiLeaks and eventually Snowden. How do we ensure lower visibility issues that implicate multiple department agency equities get adequately addressed before they become strategic failures? Finally, one result of a decline in NSC engagement is the potential for loss of interagency muscle memory. This could be incredibly important in the event of a need for a rapid response during a crisis. Terrorism, like any transnational threat, necessitates a whole-of-government response. As we move forward, we'll need to ensure that there are ample interagency mechanisms to affect such coordination. And that brings me to theme nine, the need for whole of society. As we look to the future, we need to look well beyond whole of government. Terrorist use of the internet, for instance, will require a robust partnership between government and the technology industry to prevent the distribution of propaganda, communications with supporters, and the proliferation of information to support attacks. Over the past two years, there has been a marked increase in industry willingness to work with one another, the U.S. government, and foreign partners to counter terrorism through the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, to GIF-CT. Originally created by Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and YouTube, GIFCT provides a vehicle for discussions and potential information sharing, and there has been substantial progress. Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have publicly reported that they detect over 90% of terrorist content through automated technology, meaning much of it is removed immediately after it is uploaded and never reaches the platform for public consumption. So far this year, YouTube has suspended over 42,000 channels, and removed over 163,000 videos for the promotion of terrorism. Facebook removed 6.4 million pieces of terrorist content in the first three months of this year, and Twitter suspended 166,000 unique accounts in the second half of last year for promotion of terrorism.
The recent move to establish GIFCT as an independent NGO offers a more formalized opportunity to better leverage the respective strengths of the private sector and the government against this dynamic problem. The new construct looks to sustain and deepen industry collaboration and capacity while incorporating the advice of key civil society and government stakeholders. While it remains to be seen what role government entities will play within this construct, success against the future online terrorism threat will likely only be realized through greater transparency and information sharing across the public-private divide in near real time. Current transparency reports provided by GIFCT members pertaining to content takedown efforts provide government entities with a snapshot of the scope and scale of the problem, but typically they lack sufficient detail on the methods and the type of material that is being purged. Government efforts to support technology companies could be better targeted with greater knowledge of the actual content being removed, the geolocation of its origin, and potential attribution. From this information, government entities would be able to more effectively assess trends in terrorist effective uh, assess trends in terrorist propaganda, identify new and emerging groups, key radicalizers, and the credibility of potential plots. New insight could then be passed back to the companies to enhance their models and algorithms. None of this will be easy. Companies' willingness to more robustly engage governments depends on a host of policy, legal, and proprietary concerns. But if we can mutually work through the impediments, there is no question that transparency would pay dividends. Further, additional constructs might warrant consideration. I work transnational organized crime at the NSC, and I found public-private partnerships like the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance in Pittsburgh to be a very useful platform. A 501c3 NCFTA brings together government and private sector representatives for the purposes of information sharing in the cyber crime arena. Both government and the private sector have found that construct to work well. As the threat evolves, we need to evolve. And that brings me to my last theme, 10 getting our arms around the global dimensions of non-Islamist terrorism. Nothing highlights the evolving nature of the terrorist threat more than the growth of what some call DT, others right-wing or white supremacist terrorism, and still others racially motivated violent extremism, REMV for short. The FBI clearly has the lead on purely domestic terrorism. What I want to focus on here are the global dimensions and the potential for seeing a movement. The increasingly transnational nature of RIMV, facilitated by social media and online communications, has resulted in an environment that features frequent communication between sympathizers and an open exchange of ideas. A large percentage of RIMV attackers in recent years have either displayed outreach to like-minded individuals or groups or referenced early attackers as sources of inspiration. For instance, Anders Breivik, Dylan Roof and Brenton Tarrant have gained international reverence and are serving as inspiration for many RMVs, including those looking to plan or conduct attacks. Brevik has inspired or at least been praised or researched by at least five RMV attackers or plotters since 2014, spanning from the U.S. to the U.K., Germany, and New Zealand. Roof has inspired at least two attackers or plotters since his June 2015 attack against a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina. And Tarrant, who himself was inspired by Brevik and praised Roof and other MV attackers, has inspired at least three attackers since his March 2019 attack in Christchurch, New Zealand. The connections go well beyond inspiration. We see overseas travel by white supremacists to fight in conflict areas, communications against racially motivated violent extremists and the provision of, of funds. Some of this involves connections to nonviolent but extreme, quote, right-wing organizations. Some of this involves connections to active paramilitary groups or those that have been banned or designated as terrorist organizations by other countries. And some of this involves connections between like-minded individuals who might or might not someday move from exploring an extreme ideology to radicalization to mobilization to violence. 
we don't fully understand how attackers are influenced and or what constitutes meaning meaningful relationships between extremists. Unlike Islamist extremism that in recent years has been led by relatively large hierarchical organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, REMV does not feature authoritative or structured organizations or a monolithic ideology. <clears throat> Instead, it is dominated by lone actors and small cells who use the online space as a borderless safe haven. They are inspired by a number of perceived concerns including political, social, economic, legal, demographic, environmental, and personal issues. Moving forward, we will have to address a whole host of issues. Fortunately, there are lessons learned from Islamist IT that could be applicable in the DT Rumby, <coughs> excuse me, DT Rumby space. Whole of government, improve information sharing, a focus on individuals and facilitation networks, work with the private sector and foreign partners, and so forth. That said, there are some challenges unique to this problem set. The lack of a DT statute and associated material support charges. The added complexity of constitutionally protected free speech and the associated difference between the United States and our partners. And the fact that perpetrators are often lone actors substantially complicates the kinds of designations used in IT. I'd also highlight two far broader issues. First, for almost two decades, the United States has pointed abroad at countries who are exporters of extreme Islamist ideology. We are now being seen as the exporters of white supremacist ideology. That's a reality with which we are going to have to deal. And secondly, as we grapple with how to deal with a global RIMV movement, we need to be very careful. In the case of the international Islamist terrorist threat, we lost some control of the narrative. Among, amongst vulnerable Sunni populations, radicalization has succeeded under the pretense that the West is conducting a war against Islam. It's false, but it's effective. We need to guard against that in the RIMV space. We must disaggregate appropriately dealing with violent white supremacist activity while not being perceived as painting with too broad a brush and impinging on legitimate right-wing political activity and free speech. Keeping control of the narrative and creating the international toolbox for that particular disaggregation is gonna be tricky, but absolutely necessary so as not to make the problem worse than it already is. So in conclusion, let me take you back to the questions I posed at the outset. What does the national risk equation look like as the country confronts a very complex international security environment? How do we optimize our CT resources in the best interest of the country when departments and agencies may have somewhat different priorities? And if we're going to reduce efforts against terrorism, how do we do so in a manner that doesn't inadvertently reverse some of the gains of the past 18 years? Reasonable people could answer those questions in very different ways and the answers are most assuredly not self-evident. They deserved informed consideration by thought leaders inside and outside the government. I do believe that the 10 themes I've laid out that involve focusing on all aspects of the current and future terrorist threat, addressing a host of must-dos, and resolving a series of complicated emotive issues will help us inform and develop a good government risk assessment as we move forward. Thanks very much. Thank you, Russell. That was uh, a really tremendous uh, um, presentation that really covered the waterfront. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask um, a series of three questions that will take us across the kind of ideological uh, spectrum, and then we'll open it up uh, to uh, everyone here for, for questions and answers. Um, so my first question is this. Uh, you mentioned at one point that a, a military drawdown by definition leads to less human, it means to less liaison, and you talked about making sure that we do what we can uh, to make sure that we don't reverse our gains. Uh, next week, the uh, counter ISIS coalition is gonna be holding a ministerial here in DC, um, and I understand that they've taken some things off the table for the purpose of next week, like dealing with the uh, um, provinces and whether or not the coalition's geographic mission should be expanded to specifically focus next week on Syria and Iraq, given uh, the uh, uh, Turkish incursion um, and uh, the 
uh, U.S. withdrawal or partial withdrawal. Without getting into the big policy issues, just strictly from a uh, counterterrorism perspective, um, what needs to be done to be able to make sure that the current events on the ground in Northeast Syria in particular uh, don't lead to tremendous setbacks in intelligence collection uh, and um, um, losing some of the progress that we've made? Uh, so, uh, from an intel perspective, we've been very pleased uh, that the President and the Secretary of Defense have reiterated that the forces that do remain will be, um, will still have a, an ISIS mission, a counter-ISIS mission. I think that's really important. Um, from an intel perspective, uh, the, the, the foreign fighter problem and the uh, ISIS prisoners in, in that part of Syria have been a, a source of much attention for us over the last couple of years. Uh, we, uh, we have obviously been pushing very hard as a country to get um, uh, our partners to repatriate foreign fighters. Uh, that has not gone well. Um, th there are uh, tremendous issues associated with uh, judicial systems and so forth in many of our European partner countries. Um, as a result, uh, as I mentioned, um, w we've gotten kind of fatalistic about this. We've been concerned that there's a growing likelihood that eventually we could see uh, many of these foreign fighters again when they either are broken out of prison or released from prison. Um, and so the focus on biometrically enrolling and making sure that those individuals are on all the appropriate watch lists has been a, a focus across the government for the last couple of years. So I, I'm quite, quite pleased with that. Uh, <coughs> similarly, um, the SDF have been fabulous partners over the years. Um, they've borne tremendous costs in northern Syria. Uh, there is still a, a willingness to um, provide information to us. Um, they are still being, I think, very responsible in the way that they are focusing on uh, prisons, um, though they had they drew down substantially when they were responding to the, the Turkish incursion. And so for us, probably the, the greatest mid midterm concern is um, a retention of those prisoners and not bolstering the ISIS ranks and not seeing a foreign fighter outflow from Syria. Just quick follow on to that. Do you have a level of confidence that uh, biometrics have been taken of the people who have been detained so that the reports of the hundred or so, whatever the number is, of people who might have uh, escaped uh, are people that we've collected biometrics on already? Um, so we have a fog of war problem. Um, we don't know who exactly these hundred people are. Uh, as as the um, SDF was put <coughs> back, there was some movement of prisoners to different prisons. Our expe expectation was, and I think it's uh, proven to be the case, that the knowledge of where specific individuals are um, and sort of the, the list keeping that was associated with that is going to be increasingly problematic. Um, we're quite confident that we did get biometrics on uh, virtually all of the foreign fighter component, uh, probably less so in the case of uh, Iraqis and Syrians. We're certainly not as comprehensive, but uh, the expectation is that those individuals will be more likely to stay in theater anyway. <coughs> Let's move away from Sunni extremism, extremism for a moment uh, and talk for a minute about uh, Shia extremism. You mentioned early on uh, concerns about um, <coughs> Iranian uh, Hezbollah and other Iraqi Shia militia threats. Over the past few months, we've seen a sharp uptick in uh, Iranian uh, terrorist activity in the region. But we've also seen an uptick in um, activity abroad, including here in the United States. Just this week, we got news that two Iranians pled guilty in a plot which involved um, surveillance of both MEK and uh, Jewish uh, targets here in the United States. Uh, from the Hezbollah side, we've had one individual uh, convicted in, in New York City, another who pled guilty, a uh, third who's been indicted and is awaiting trial. How does the community look at the issue of uh, Shia extremist terrorism in the context of this uptick of activity? Um, so, so the Bureau works this problem really hard in the United States, and we do see these kind of periodic arrests. Um, uh, I think, frankly, the uptick in activity in the region is what is of greater concern to us, the, sort of the pressure campaign, the response to the pressure campaign, the potential for hair triggers, the, the activity of the um, uh, Shia militia groups in Iraq in particular, the relationship with Quds Force. Um, that, that's going to bear really close watching in the years ahead. Uh, um, so that's kind of where we are, I think. 
And then finally, before I open it up to questions and answers from the audience, uh, I want to kind of mold together your thoughts <laughs> about the uh, right wing or, or REMV, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremist kind of transnational terrorist activity on the one hand, and um, and uh, your points on, on social media, because the growth of one is so dependent uh, on the other. Um, do you think that government needs to play a, a greater role uh, in regulating uh, the social media um, uh, private sector, or do you think they're doing a good enough job? Um, I led a small group out to uh, California a few months ago, and we came back um, feeling that there were some things in which the private sector on social media was really doing in incredibly uh, good, uh, very forward-leaning work. Uh, but that it wasn't consistent. Mm -hmm. So for some platforms, the issue of free speech mm -hmm. and being able to say anything you want anywhere is taken much more uh, strongly than others. Some platforms will not only uh, deplatform you for counterterrorism, but for hate, uh, which is in some ways even more forward-leaning than government. The fact that it's inconsistent, uh, is it a problem that the uh, industry is self-regulating? Do we need to get involved? Um, I think the government has to be really careful about getting involved. Um, the, hence my point about transparency. Uh, the, the terms of service um, are the province of the individual platforms. Uh, and as you say, some are far more forward-leaning. Some are more willing to engage with the government. As I said, we've been a huge fan of GIFCT. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the platforms themselves are struggling with um, uh, once you get outside the realm of an ISIS association or an Al-Qaeda association, it makes it harder for them to train their algorithms. And there's going to be, I hope, um, a growing conversation uh, related to the REMV space and, and how do you do that? And there, there are lots of questions about what constitutes incitement and, and how far you can go. And many of these individuals, like we see in, the, in some of the Islamist case, are pretty savvy about staying within the legal bounds of the First Amendment. Um, and so we're in, we're in kind of new territory. Uh, I think the strategic picture here is that um, there has been a tremendous growth in the conversation between the social media companies and the government. They have been much more forward-leaning over the last couple of years, and that just needs to continue. And the final corollary to that, and then we'll open it up, is, is this. Um, uh, I was pleased to hear you uh, acknowledge, because I hear it every time I go abroad, as a former government official, that uh, we, the United States, are being seen by many as the source of a particular type of extremism, right-wing extremist ideology, in the same way that we saw others uh, being responsible for that in, in other contexts, and, and a significant amount of, um, of, of anger and frustration with us saying, well, we have some legal restrictions and how we can deal with that. Um, Leaving aside the bit that is clearly in the FBI and DOJ's uh, <coughs> realm, um, from a NCTC perspective, as you engage with partners, are there authorities of some type that you would like us to have or to change domestically so that we could deal specifically with the transnational aspect of this? Do you find that when we're following a transnational threat, REMV or otherwise, and it comes back to the United States in some way that we are hindered from pursuing that? Um, this is a work in progress. Uh, the, the government is kind of feeling its way forward. Um, I was cautious about the way I talked about the, the nature of those connections and what they mean. Um, th there, is a, there are some that want very much to designate f overseas organizations in a way we do with FTOs. Uh, we're going to have to be really careful about that. We've seen some examples here just recently about um, entities like the Azov Battalion in Ukraine, that there are those that would like to designate that entity. Parts of that entity are parts of the Ukrainian National Guard. Um, and so there, the, the potential for unintended consequences and, as I said, making the situation worse if we're not careful, I think, are, 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 are simply there. And so we're, we're going to have to go kind of slowly here and be deliberative, both to understand the problem and then go through the potential toolkit. Great. Thank you. So let me open it up to questions and answers uh, now. Um, raise your hand if you have a, a question and uh, wait for Mike just to identify yourself. We'll start right up here with my colleague Charles. 
Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned in your in one of your answers the the problem um, of the foreign fighters, European foreign fighters in northeastern Syria, and you also mentioned um, the Iraqis and the Syrians that were uh, detained in um, northeastern Syria as well. Um, so my question would be. Leaving aside the European question, which has got a lot of attention, uh, what is your assessment of the risk and the potential trends regarding the Iraqis and the Syrians, knowing that in 2007, 2009 in Iraq, we saw um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq's affiliates uh, going underground and then re-emerging years later, so there is kind of a, a history of um, militants uh, di disappearing and then reappearing. How do you assess the threat and what are the other possible scenarios when it comes to ISIS detainees from Iraq and Syria um, in the region? Yeah, so six, six years or so ago, uh, ISIS, maybe down to a thousand individuals in, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the the um, bottom line number right now is 14,000. Some would think it's substantially higher than that, mostly in Iraq and lesser degree Syria. And <clears throat> the, they were they recognized the end of the caliphate was coming a couple of years ago and started um, moving towards a, an insurgent orientation, going underground, as you suggest. Uh, our concern about that is that given what they did six years ago, 14,000 people now at least, potentially another oh, eight or 9,000 that are in prisons. Before his death, Abu Dua had did a radio thing in which he called for attacking those prisons and IDP camps and breaking people out. So uh, I think the expectation is that uh, that number is going to do nothing but grow. Now, uh, in terms of activity on the ground, um, there, there are already no-go areas at night, and we see ISIS flags, and we see small areas in which Sharia is being implemented, and um, uh, the, the whole crop burning thing and everything else. So the, the insurgency is alive and kicking in, in northwest uh, Iraq, for sure, and to a lesser degree Syria. Um, I, I don't see the the forcing function for why that gets better. It's going to require a combination of both military pressure and dealing with the, uh, the entire sort of demand side of the equation. Um, the reconstruction has gone far slower than any of us would have liked, and so the potential for long-term Sunni disenfranchisement in that part of, of those countries uh, is pretty significant. So in that regard, I think there there's a lot of work to do. Over here, Mr. Sinai. <coughs> Very much. Uh, my name is Anwar Sadat. I come from Egypt. I'm a politician, parliamentarian. I'm here as a guest scholar at Washington Institute. I would like to have your comment in two issues. One, how do you see this terrorist attacks happening in Sinai? Do you think this is a terrorist attacks or it's a kind of revenge uh, as uh, a result of, let's say, um, security strategy which is not working there? Although it's only the whole area is 50 kilometers, you know. Mm -hmm whereby the army have been mobilizing a lot of troops, the police, and there is also such a close cooperation with Israel in the, in the border. So how do you see this? Is it a kind of revenge of those young Bedouins um, who are somehow feeling marginalized, uh, not belonging anymore? This is number one. Number two, do you believe on running or having a kind of dialogue with those who are in prison from Gama Islamia, the Islamic member of the Islamic groups, especially the youngsters. Do you believe that there is a real chance for convincing them or changing their beliefs uh, so they could refrain from violence and they could be released and integrated again in the society? Do you think this is a possibility or it's a hopeless case uh, uh, since the environment outside is the same. Poverty, same social, economic problem, human right abuse. I mean, so what chances do you think? Thank you. Uh, so on the first question, um, uh, there is both uh, an ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, presence in Sinai. Um, I think um, 
to the, to the text of your question, it's a little bit of both. I mean, there's certainly an underlying causes issue, but we, we have seen the, the ISIS element in Sinai has sworn allegiance to the new head of ISIS. And so I, I think we've got, um, we've got an existing terrorist cells that are conducting attacks mostly in the northern part of Sinai. On the second question, uh, the, unfortunately, I think globally we're seeing um, prisons be incubators for, for radicalization and terrorism. I don't think anyone has broken the code on how you deal with it. We've had individuals in United States prisons who have gotten out who are every bit as radical as they were when they went in. Um, our European partners have this problem in spades. We're looking at, and um, because of the length of prison sentences, we're on the cusp of seeing hundreds to thousands of people come out uh, that were very radicalized when they went in or got radicalized when they went in. So um, uh, I, I certainly take your point that we've got a lot of work to do, uh, but um, there have been sort of debates about whether you put all these prisoners together, whether you try to break them up. We, um, the European partners are kind of going back and forth on some of this, uh, and all of them have demonstrated challenges. There's, there are not a lot of success stories in terms of people coming out of prisons that have been if not de-radicalized, at least disengaged. Please, right here in the middle, please. Um, Louise Shelley, George Mason University. One of the points that you made was the increasing intersection of transnational crime and terrorism. But in your strategies, you didn't talk about ways that you can utilize these um, analyses or these interactions and do network analysis that from one side that may be more um, vulnerable to infiltration than the other. Uh, so I mentioned I did a, a couple of years at the NSC um, working in transnational organized crime and uh, I actually went there with the uh, avowed goal of creating an NCTC like entity to do transnational organized crime. Um, it seems to me that uh, good things happen when you bring the government together and you give a young analyst very broad access to information to do the kind of identity network analysis. Um, in, in my, we're, we're moving a little bit in that direction right now, fortunately, I think. Um, uh, and there is a, a belief under uh, something called NSPM7 that we want to do similar work in the transnational criminal databasing um, that we do in the case of terrorist identities. Uh, that seems to me to be a very good idea, that if we start cataloging these people for the purposes of both looking um, at intersections with terrorism as well as knowing if potential bad guys want to come to the country and, and sort of who they're connected with. Uh, but there are, there are still lots of issues because um, as, as disparate as terrorism was back before 9-11, I think transnational crime has even spread further across the government. So we've got a long ways to go in terms of a, um, a consensus about how you should consolidate those efforts, who should do what kind of database work, but that's the direction I think in which we need to go. Are you right here? Hi, thank you. Katie Zimmerman from the American Enterprise Institute. You, you opened by starting the discussion about risk and the risk that we're facing now as we're, as we're drawing resources toward the great power competition as we are refocusing across the government away from the terrorism threat and Americans are feeling quite safe here at home not having witnessed another 9-11 attack. The challenges that you lay out to the counterterrorism efforts that we have include a decline in interagency uh, coordination and focus, um, the question of how we have actually a whole of government approach to counterterrorism. Um, but what I wanted to ask is outside of the counterterrorism realm, um, can you discuss the risk about relying on only a counterterrorism strategy against threats from Al Qaeda and the Islamic State and how the counterterrorism strategy might match up with a country or region wide? Uh, strategy to counter the local groups themselves that you know are eventually producing the threats that you're working against. Oh, um, in my opinion, the the counterterrorism strategy that came out uh, last year was a really a very good exemplar of how the government is still working this problem together. Uh, a number of people in this room worked on it back then, um, 
and it is not just about capturing and killing. Uh, there's a lot of focus in there on the prevention issue, um, uh, working with, with locals and having to do this thing kind of multinational, all of which uh, is exactly the right thing, I think, to do. Question is sort of now follow through. Um, the, 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 the notion of terrorism prevention has, I think, um, been, played a significant role in three out of the four terrorist strategy, counterterrorism strategies that we've done since 9-11. The reality is we haven't made a lot of progress in, in terrorism prevention. Uh, for a long time, we didn't know what worked. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there's going to be a tremendous challenge in, as, as you suggest, some of these um, um, uh, groups in Africa and the, how does that relate to the Africa strategy and what are we going to do with um, uh, foreign development and so forth. And so that that's going to continue to be a, a significant challenge, I think, for, for AID and so forth. <coughs> Delved in with Voice of America. Wondering, do you know any more today than you did last week about the, the new ISIS leader? And are you surprised at all by the propaganda campaign that Islamic State's been running to show how different groups are supporting him? And secondly, where does the counterterrorism strategy fit into the great power strategy? And are you seeing any signs that great powers or even regional powers are starting to manipulate or try to use terrorist groups as proxies, if not to accomplish something for themselves, just to make things more difficult for the U.S.? Uh, on the first, I actually think this is playing out largely as we expected. Um, there we saw the announcement of Abdullah's death, and then we saw uh, the the new guy get named, and we saw the call for um, retaliatory attacks, and we saw um, some eulogies, and we saw um, the the branches and networks start to um, swear allegiance um, to the new caliph. Um, this this is very similar to what happened. Uh, Back in 2010, um, there was actually a substantial period of time between the the um, uh, name that came out uh, with Abu Bakr al Baghdadi and our recognition, figuring out who he actually was. Um, as I, I mentioned on the Hill, uh, um, the our our sort of view was that Haji Abdullah would be a logical candidate for uh, taking over, um, but we're not at a point of having. Um, a confirmation sort of who it is. On the uh, great power thing, um, this, is, um, this is an added dimension to the, uh, the, the RIMV problem that, that I didn't mention, but that we're going to have to work our way through, that there, is, um, there, there are certainly examples of uh, the Russian state um, uh, sort of exploiting issues to play to right-wing grievances, and uh, how do we deal with that? Um, it's an interesting question for NCTC in that my remit is counterterrorism. I get access to counterterrorism information. Um, ex, uh, issues associated with the Russian state would not be something that would fall within my bailiwick. So we're, we're going to have to work that with the Bureau in terms of how they handle it within counterintelligence channels. So, but you would have opportunity to work with the Russians, <laughs> what comes up with the Russians when it comes to counterterrorism. And, and I wonder mm -hmm. if you could comment on, mm -hmm. especially given events in, in Syria and Iraq, you know, not everybody, not everybody in that region in particular, sees the Islamic mm -hmm. State as the number one threat that we do. Um, so, in particular, at a time when the majority of forces on the ground are maybe from countries like Turkey or Syria or Russia that maybe have a different prioritization than we do. How does that affect our ability to work with them or maybe even more importantly work with other partners on the ground to deal with what for us is one of the, the primary terrorist problems, Islamic State? Yeah, and I think the Turks are the clear example here that um, they will profess uh, interest in counterterrorism, but it is almost entirely, it is primarily PKK. I mean, their, their concern about ISIS is far less. There haven't been ISIS attacks in Turkey in a while. Uh, and so... Um, th this is why I hearken back to the issue of prisons and who's going to take them over and how concerned the Turks are going to be. Um, I do think that they, uh, they would not be interested in holding a, a ton of, of European foreign fighters. They would want to get them back to European countries. How exactly is that going to work, if it's going to work? And so uh, 
the, the sort of um, focus and, and emphasis we've had on our SDF um, uh, partners for a very long time is going to, um, that's going to be challenged with the Turkish incursion. Tabora in the back. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Devorah Margolin, Program on Extremism at George Washington. Um, you kind of touched on Turkey a little bit, and I wanted to push on that. Um, they announced yesterday that they'll begin to send home foreign fighters in the next 24 hours, possibly. What does that mean? Um, you touched a bit on the European partners and their lack of willingness to take people back. Will the U.S. step in? Is there a plan? What are we doing? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, the, uh, what we have seen is uh, from our European partners some concern here and they've started stripping citizenship so they don't have to take them back. Um, uh, how this kabuki dance is going to shake out, uh, I don't know. Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you very much. Um, Hernan Rosenberg from Development Outcomes. <clears throat> uh, for obvious reasons, we were concentrating in the Middle East and others, but we are a nice little fist right now in our own hemisphere you know, with the uh, massive riots and whatnot, particularly in the South, and there's been a well-established connection between um, Iranian uh, affairs and, and what's going on in Argentina. Are we doing anything about that? Do you see any connection there with, the, are, or is that of any interest, or we're going to just wait and see what happens? Uh, it's being dealt with much more by the regional bureaus, and so I really don't have anything to say. Okay. Right here in the back. Hi, Nick Harrington from CSIS. Um, are you seeing any evidence of outright Russian support to some of these uh, groups that you had mentioned, some of these uh, racially motivated violent extremists, either in the U.S., otherwise through you know financial support, sponsorship, uh, other types of activities? Uh, n not that I've seen. Um, th as I mentioned, the, the, the trying to work schisms and... Um, uh, cause a greater movement in that direction. It's uh, sort of influence issues more than anything else. I think your mention of, of finance makes me think that especially since one of my Georgetown students from my class that I co-teach with, with Kate Bauer on combating the financing of transnational threats, and she's here, I'm going to ask a question for her. Can you, uh, can you comment on um, on the continued efficacy of our counter-terror finance tools? There's been a lot out recently including from members of Congress, but generally about whether sanctions continue to be effective. I'm not asking you about sanctions in general, but how effective, how important do you see the, the CFT toolkit, the counter-terror finance toolkit in particular? Um, well, it, it has demonstrated success in the past, to be sure. Um, the, the history of a lot of terrorist attacks uh, has been that it really doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, when the when New Zealand looked at what Tarrant had been doing, um, what they found was small amounts of money that were being donated to identitarians and so forth. Um, that's that's a challenge. Again, it's back to the signal noise problem when you've got trillions of dollars sloshing around, identifying the particular money going to the particular individual. Uh, and, and this implicates an additional issue that I talked about, which is, um, there are a lot of regulations that go along with being able to commingle data sets with money, and that makes it difficult for analysts, be they at Treasury or the Bureau or, or the intelligence community at large, to be able to track, in, track money. So a corollary to that, whether you're talking about REMV attacks like Tarrant or uh, other HVE attacks in the Al-Qaeda ISIS world, is the fact that, you know, when I think back to the way things were when I started my career in counterterrorism with the FBI in the 1990s, you know, the, the key tripwires that we looked at then when it comes to these lone offenders are, are largely um, irrelevant, uh, which is to say travel, communications, uh, and financial transfers. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the... <coughs> What are the greatest challenges just kind of operationally in dealing with the HVE threat given that reality and how do we accommodate? So I think pretty much every Western country services um, are, are grappling with that precise problem. I think the, the UK um, is one of the um, 
uh, I think highlights uh, given the attacks that they had in 1617 and uh, at the time they were they actually did a review after London Bridge and so forth and and concluded that there were something like 30,000 subjects of interest that had been on the radar screen at one point uh, and and the conclusion was that at any given time um, they could do 24/7 surveillance of a few maybe dozens um, there would be open investigations of thousands and that there were going to be a lot more that were going to have to sort of sit fallow unless something came in that caused them to um, be higher on the on the priority so the, the question is how do you identify a dot that's down in the noise level and be able to bring it up so that you know that you have to allocate investigative resources here again this gets back to the the issue of technology, I think. Uh, um, in the case of NCTC, the approach that we are taking right now is um, the ability to do recurrent search against any particular individual who might be on the screen. In part, this is to deal with the HVE problem now, but it's also to deal with it for the analyst after next. I mean, so many of these people will resurface several years later, and the reality is we have a a workforce that comes and goes. And so the, 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 this issue of knowledge management and effectively downloading a brain, uh, I think technology can help with that. Um, it better because there are never going to be enough investigative resources to be able to look at every individual who is radicalized out there. Rob. Very much. I, I found this remarkably chilling and scary your presentation um, not because Rob there is our executive director not because there isn't enormous progress um, and of the uh, the amazing achievements that you and your colleagues are doing but because of uh, what I take away is as at least the implied net um, conclusion which is the situation is really bad out there and so um, uh, I just want to ask you um, uh, if there are 20 if there are 20 times more, potential bad guys. Are we 20 times better um, than we were before 9-11? Or are we, in a net way, even worse off than we were on September 10th, 2001? Yeah, it's, it's a... Please say yes. <laughs> it's a perfectly um, fair question. Uh, uh, the strategic concern I have is that there are far more radicalized people out there now than there were 18 years ago. I, I don't think anybody questions that. Now, are, are those individuals of primary concern in a local region area, which should bother us, but they're not going to be perceived as threats to the homeland? You certainly don't have currently, today, um, the kind of capability that we saw to reach out and touch the homeland that we saw in the heyday of Al-Qaeda or the heyday of ISIS. But again, to my point that we need to ensure we don't sort of freeze our thinking in 2019 what is this going to look like in some number of years going forward um, if, if we start to pull back against the, the counterterrorism target? Um, we're going to have to focus on sort of dealing with these organizations and, and have enough intelligence that we know uh, sort of what the nature of the threat to U.S. interests, either in theater or to the homeland. That, I think, is going to get to be a harder problem for us, um, and, and maybe the threat will sort of stay local, um, but uh, given the history of the last 18 years, I don't think we can count on that. And then the, the, the technology issue, as I'm, I'm sure you've heard the director of the FBI talk a lot about this encryption problem and w what does it mean to go dark? And we are really good at technology, but it's going to make it a much harder problem for us, which probably means they're going to have to be far more human, which probably means we need to be there. Uh, and so how does all that net out? Is that, um, uh, there, there is a tremendous amount of good news, and, and we, need to, we need to embrace that, but we just need to recognize that um, th this effort has to continue because there are some worrisome trends out there. Yes, sir, right here in the middle. Bring a mic over here, please. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Smith at the Center for Public Integrity. Um, one of the ways in which you said that things were looking a little darker was uh, the prospect of chemical or biological use by terrorists. Could you uh, help us dig a little bit deeper on that and say uh, what you've seen so far 
in terms of um, any groups embracing or moving towards embracing that kind of technology and what your prediction more concretely is about the possibility of use. You said it, it changed from considered unlikely to considered more probable, but maybe you could uh, give us a more granular estimate than that. Sure. Um, so in, I mean, there, it, to a degree, uh, it was normalized in, in Iraq and uh, Syria, I think, um, uh, with, with what ISIS was, was able to do. Um, we have, um, I don't know how many, we have seen numerous ricin plots interrupted around the globe um, over the last several years. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of concern about the ease with which um, poison gases could be developed. Uh, and it, I think um, for many of my colleagues, there's uh, a bit of surprise that we haven't already seen that, um, just, just given uh, past history. So uh, there, um, Al Qaeda flirted with this stuff um, 15 years ago. Um, we never saw it operationalized. It looks to us like uh, ISIS has gone a somewhat easier route in terms of developing those capabilities. Um, and there are um, uh, instructions that, that float around. And so uh, we, we can't be at all uh, sanguine, I think, about the nature of that threat. Yes, right here, please. Hi, I'm Carissa Wilkinson. I'm a recent graduate from the University of New Haven. You mentioned briefly in your opening remarks about um, the shifting tactic of continuing to focus on targeting children and bringing that out. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how terrorist organizations are going about doing that and how we should respond to that, as well as um, de-radicalization efforts for children who have gro grown up surrounded by extremist ideology in countries such as Iraq and Syria. Yeah, this um, is, is getting a tremendous amount of attention uh, from our European partners who have this problem much worse than we do. There are uh, an awful lot of children were born uh, in the caliphate and uh, um, their fathers may well have been killed and the Europeans are struggling with what do they do. Um, there's been some willingness to bring orphans back. Um, um, some countries are now increasingly, after the Turkish incursion, talking about trying to bring women and children back. Uh, but the, the social services issue associated with how do you deal with these kids and um, just what kind of mental shape are they going to be in is an area for, um, of concern across Europe. So we've learned a lot about um, the Islamic State over the years. <clears throat> Some of that is still in the classified domain material maybe that was seized in the Abu Sayyaf raid or more recently in the Baghdadi raid. And some of that through friends like at the program on extremism, through the, the ISIS files uh, project um, uh, is becoming made, is public and being used by researchers outside of government as well. What do you think um, uh, from the material that we know about ISIS can help us kind of be predictive towards where it's going to, what it's going to become next. And I, I ask you that because uh, last time we had one of your colleagues from NCTC for one of these lectures about a year and a half ago, I think we had General Nagata. And he talked about the strategic surprise that caught us when, with the sudden rise of ISIS, right, that, that JV League team that suddenly became something so much more. And here at the Washington Institute, we've been giving some thought to kind of uh, the way we think about these movements in between their big mobilizations, when it tends to get our attention, when we've kind of dealt with one mobilization, it's trending <coughs> down, we're doing well, people want to move re resources elsewhere. What do you think we can kind of learn from what we've collected and understood from the past of ISIS as to what we might expect from them in the near future? Um, I mean, I do think the next couple of years are probably likely to be very interesting. Um, uh, we discuss this amongst ourselves all the time, that um, when, when the caliphate was declared and they started taking over large swaths of territory, they put a huge bullseye on their back. Um, mm -hmm. ISIS is a learning organization. Uh, it is very bureaucratic. Um, in, in my own mind, I wonder if they would be content with um, conducting sort of a pr 
prolonged insurgency and staying underground to avoid the kind of um, pressure that they absorbed from the coalition over the last couple of years, but I mean, uh, nobody, nobody knows. Um, but the, the, the more we draw down, um, the more we sort of siphon resources off to other very high priority threats, the greater the likelihood is that we're not going to understand that dynamic moving forward. And that's probably the biggest concern that I've got. Okay. One last question from Charles. Uh. Um, what is the impact of the kind of politicization of the just the concept of uh, terrorism that we see in different contexts and countries? What is the impact of this on your work? How do you, I mean, does how does it affect uh, the information you process and the kind of working relationship you can have with the international partners when they use the concept according to other uh, national uh, interests? Yeah, it gets into a real wonky answer, um, but uh, th things like um, the Houthis, uh, is that a terrorist organization? Is it an insurgent organization? It's, um, it's the beneficiary of state support. Uh, w what we're finding within our community is that the, the counterterrorism effort was pretty well stitched together for uh, many years. Uh, over time, um, some of these efforts <clears throat> associated in Africa, the Houthis, others have moved from the counterterrorism to regional bureaus. And that complicates the, the sort of the coordination and effort across our departments and agencies. They're not necessarily, I mean, we're huge. There's a massive number of people in our intelligence community. Um, making sure that you know all of the right people so that you can talk to them on a daily basis as the effort is uh, more disparate across the departments and agencies, it does make that harder. Uh, and um, it also makes things like information sharing harder. I mean, um, Chris and his colleagues, when they beat us up after the 9-11 Commission, were <laughs> focused very much on ensuring that information got to all the relevant analysts so that we could do that kind of analysis. Well, information sharing comes with legal and policy and privacy and security and operational kind of restrictions and impediments. Um, when it's all... Uh, um, when it's husbanded in the counterterrorism community, then we can work that. As you see it move out to all of these other disciplines, then it does make it harder, and some of these entities are, in fact, operating very much like terrorist organizations, and so that can complicate the, the analytic discipline within our community. Well, I'm very pleased we were able to end with a question that, that truly is able to bring out your inner thoughtful nerd, because I think that's something... <laughs> Uh, to be embraced as, as a fellow traveler. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking uh, Russell Travelers for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for all you do. Keep us safe. Have a great holiday weekend, everybody.